fly. Right. <laughs> That's dangerous. And it catch, what if it catches that moth on fire? She needs to put a net over it. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Not as of lately. A couple of weeks I'll be gone for two weeks, so I will be off of Facebook for a while. <coughs> so I apologize for that. My numbers have gone down. Mm -hmm. My popularity is not there anymore. <laughs> Instead of having 10 people that like me, I now have three. So that's okay. Who knows? Uh, I'm hoping that in 50 years from now when I'm dead, you know, that all of a sudden someone sees those videos and they go, wow, and all of a sudden I get millions of views, right? <laughs> so you never know. <clears throat> If you'd like to join us here at the church, we'd love to have you. We're at 5383 Harupa Valley off of Martin Street. Today we will continue in the book of Titus, this little letter, and we're going to look at uh, chapter 2, Sound Doctrine. Good morning, Diana. Glad you're here watching. There's one of them that watches us. <laughs> there should be two more somewhere. They're hiding. There's two more hiding. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let's go ahead and pray on this Good Friday. Father, thank you, Lord, for getting us up this morning, Lord, Yes. and for your grace, Lord. And for those that are sick, Father, including my wife who has a cold, Deborah gave it to her, Lord. <laughs> we pray for grace and strength. I don't know how she does it. Uh, she's still out there feeding her animals, taking care of things, and, and still uh, working around the house with this cold, Lord. Me, I, I go straight to bed, and I lay there till I'm done. But, Lord, she's so strong, and <clears throat> women usually are, Lord. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for your grace that gets us through those things. And anyone else that's sick, Lord, touch them, heal them, Lord. Father, right now someone might be watching, Father, that has some sort of illness, cancer, disease, or, or some chronic illness, Lord, and, and you're going to heal them, Lord God. We just believe it, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Just go before us today and give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying here, Lord. Help us, Lord, to receive your word. Lord, these are not just words that fall to the ground or just enter in one ear, as my dad used to say, and out the other, Lord. No, these, are, these are holy words. These are the words of God himself to his children. These are words that should be uh, taken in and <clears throat> thought about deeply, meditated in, and then applied to our very lives. It should change us, Lord. And, and Lord, if it's um, contrary to what we believe or how we're living, we should embrace the word more than our own feelings and emotions. Paul made it very clear, Lord, that we are not to walk by sight or by feelings or, or by emotions, what we see, what we feel. But we're to walk by faith yes, in what you have Lord. said in your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God, Lord. And so if we want our faith to really grow as believers, then we will be challenged. Uh, you won't just let us sit in a room and where everything just goes well and right. No, Lord, we're challenged when things go wrong, when things are a struggle. Then we're challenged to believe what we really believe and apply to our lives. And so, Lord, help us to understand that. And as we read your scriptures, Father, to apply what you are saying. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so let's turn to Titus chapter 2. Chapter 2. Again, this is one of the pastoral epistles, but I really do believe that there's some great principles for all of us because we are all in a sense, pastors of our own homes. If you are married, then you're the head of your household. Uh, your wife is uh, part of your congregation. Your children are part of your congregation. And you're to pour into them the word of God. I know in our home, we do Bible studies every night. Um, I would take time to open up the scriptures and go through the Bible with my kids. And then we would pray uh, with them before they went to bed. So they're all prayered up and God would protect them. Uh, this is what a priest, what a pastor does uh, it, within his family. So let me just say one thing before we continue on here because Paul's gonna give us some instructions. In in First Timothy, we saw chapter one very clearly and I wanna turn there and if you would like, you could turn there also. But it's, it, it makes a, a, a very clear statement to us as believers, if I can find it. Verse 15, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul says here, which is interesting, he says, Of whom I am chief. Now Paul considered himself the chief of sinners. 
That's the Apostle Paul, now, this guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, qualifying his own life compared to many others, including the apostles, and he says, I am the chief of sinners. Where does that put us? Mm. Wow. Now, we are all sinners, guys. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. In, in Romans, uh, Paul makes it clear that, that all of us sin. There's a nature. There's a battle that's going on in our life. Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8, right? The beginning of chapter 8 gives us the hope. But chapter 7 gives us the heart of Paul where he's struggling between doing right and wrong. And so if the Apostle Paul is struggling uh, with those things, we also struggle with those things. Um, this is why Paul writes these letters because the church is struggling uh, with these, these things, with sinfulness. And so we cannot judge one another when it comes to uh, uh, the work of God in our lives and what God is doing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in John chapter 3, this is what Jesus said, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. This is John the Baptist. He's talking about himself here as he's in prison and wondering if Jesus was the Messiah. And, and, and John said, I must, and this is the Greek, this is in the Greek, I must, or he must continually increase in my life. And I must choose to continually decrease in my life. So you see, it's a continual action that you make every single day to allow him to increase and to allow yourself to decrease. What is that saying though when we think about this? Let's think about it a little bit more deeply before we get into the scripture this morning. What Paul, what Jesus is saying here, guys, it's not about you. It's about me. You have to remove yourself completely, decrease yourself to nothing. Well, that doesn't make us feel very well, right? How would you like it if someone came around and said, you're nothing, you're nothing, you're nothing, you're nothing. <laughs> you know, I would look at that person, you're right, I'm nothing. But in Jesus Christ, I'm everything. So it's not about me, and we shouldn't be offended at that. Boy, we deserve hell, don't we? Amen. And yet God saved our souls, and so we deserve nothing. And so when we're offended by someone, who cares? Who cares? My value is in Christ, not in someone else's opinion of myself. My value is what Jesus says my value is. In his definition of my value is enormous for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten sin that whoever believes in it continually believes in him should not perish and so we must decrease that's not about us you start feeling me and I and this person don't let that's all about you isn't it you need to decrease that and let it be about Jesus all right now saying that <clears throat> we need to understand that we're still sinners and we have to continually decrease and allow Christ to increase in our lives so this is what Paul is saying in chapter 2. But as for you, and he's speaking to Titus here, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. He's going to list all the things that are proper. Uh, it's important that a pastor teaches from the Bible, right? From Genesis to Revelation. And he teaches every single book, every chapter, every verse. And he amplifies that so that people understand it. I was blessed this weekend um, <clears throat> with uh, our leadership as we went away on a retreat and spent a good four days with one another. And they really encouraged me. One brother um, just took some time and he wanted to really encourage me. And, and he said, Pastor, I, I want you to know that when you teach, you make it so simple uh, that I understand it and that others understand it. You, you're not so high up there with your knowledge and your words uh, that it goes over. I took that as a compliment, not as a criticism at all. I am simple-minded and I love the fact that I am and I, I can teach to the simple-minded people, and that's who God loves sometimes. It's just the simple-minded people most of the time. So sound doctrine is important. Um, <clears throat> what we believe is important, and, and how we live that is so important. It's not about us. It's not about what we believe. Just as um, that shirt that you know I was commenting this morning about uh, Jack's shirt there. What does it say again? It's, it's, it takes... Uh, it takes more faith uh, to not believe in God. And that's so true. It takes more faith to not believe in God. But the faith that people use to not believe in God is the faith that they believe in themselves, right? They make themselves God. I can't believe in a God that's trying to tell me what to do. <laughs> He's trying to change my life for the better, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what I believe is right. And so they're putting their faith in themselves. And see, that's contrary to what God is saying. You have to get rid of yourself and you have to let God live through you and life will be so much easier. So here's the sound doctrine, that older men be sober, 
The word sober that means there is do not be given over to wine. So don't be a drinker. I think that principle should be for all Christians. Be careful Amen. that you don't drink and get drunk. A reverent, temperate, <clears throat> sound in faith. <clears throat> you have a, a sound faith. You know what you believe. And no matter what, nothing will, will take away that faith from you. I always said that if aliens came down in a spaceship right in front of me, I still would have faith in Christ. You know, because that's some demonic force. Now, I'm not saying that aliens will come down at all, but I don't believe there are aliens. I believe there are angels. Uh, but my point is, is that nothing's going to, you know, remove the faith for, that I have in Christ Jesus. In love, um, <clears throat> in patience, older women, likewise, that they may be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now, he gives us older men, older women. This is the responsibility of older men and, and older women. Uh, this isn't a suggestion. Uh, this isn't uh, uh, a work for your salvation. These are the very characteristics that older men and women should have. And if you don't have these characteristics, Paul is saying that these uh, characteristics should be had by older men and women. So if you're reading this, you're thinking, okay, I'm drinking too much wine, I need to stop. That's what you should be doing. Where some people would read that and go, oh no, that's not what it's talking about. But <laughs> when you know it is, but you're trying to, to make the decision that you're gonna continue to drink wine, right? They're saying there's no sound. Everybody's saying there's no sound. Yeah, well, there's, there's gotta be sound. It's, it's on. <clears throat> yeah, so it's, it's there, their phone, so. Okay, so. Um, Likewise with the older women too. Okay, let's move on. Verse four. That they admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, uh, to be discreet. Um, discreet would mean like uh, uh, self-examining. Uh, you know, don't, don't just be out there. Don't just share everything. Uh, there are things you should share. There are things that you shouldn't share. So be discreet about the things that you share. Chase, uh, homemakers. Now that's, a, that's one that just doesn't fit in our culture today, right? Even within Christianity. I remember back in the 70s, um, in the 70s or so, right around the 80s, this whole movement of the women's liberation began to take place, you know? Uh, even earlier than that, when women started going back to work. And by the way, you know why women went back to work? because of the wars. <clears throat> All the men were fighting the wars yeah. and, and so forth, World War I, World War II, and they needed people to work, so the women started working. It used to be that the man worked, the woman stayed home, watched the child. That was the culture, that was our foundation from our founding fathers because of what scriptures had taught us. But then when the war came in, men were gone and they needed people to work. They needed people to make the weapon tree, to take the, 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 the tires, the rubbers, and you know all of that stuff. So women started working, even children started working. And when that happened, it brought more income into the family household and they were like, wow, we could actually have more money, more stuff. And so when the men came back afterward, they said, why quit? Let's, let's both work. And that whole thing started. And now today we see it all kind of confusing where both are working and the kids are being watched by the school district and raised by them or by someone else and usually grandparents or the parents of, of the couple. Um, it's no longer what God had intended it to be. Uh, it says here that uh, these young women should be homemakers. Those aren't my words, by the way. I'm not a male chauvinist pig. <laughs> you know, they should be homemakers. You know, when I read that, I told my wife, I says, you're not working. I would have loved for her to go to work. We made, I made good money, and if she would have made good money, we would have had some great stuff. You know, by now, I would have had a beach house right on the beach because I know people that worked in my business that have beach houses now, and I would have had that, but it's not what God wanted for us. You know, so I told her, you're not gonna work. Now, there's been times where she had to go to work, and she worked for a few months or a year, but then after that, she's been pretty much a homemaker. Uh, she, you know, and, and I'll just tell you the truth here, uh, she has no credit because she never really has worked or created credit. I've tried to have her create credit by giving her credit cards, but it just doesn't work that way. Uh, she doesn't have a social security because she hasn't worked. So she really has no future income coming in except for what I bring in. And so I made sure that I provided for her if something were to happen to me. So if something happens to me, then she's taken care of because I know the church isn't going to take care of her. We've seen that in the past, even in Calvary chapels, where 
where pastors have passed away and there's nothing. And the church tries in the beginning and, and they have a heart and they give enough to get her through, but it's not a, a long time thing. And they have to go to work. They have to try to figure out how to survive because her husband's gone that didn't provide for them. I provided for my wife, so she'll be taken care of if something was to happen to me. That's what a husband does. I think that's, I think that's love. I think that's caring for your homemaker, the woman that's taking care of your, you and your children, is making sure they will be taken care of. I remember, I won't tell you who it was, but I remember someone was told you ought to get you know, some life insurance for your wife, and they're like, I'll be gone, it's not, I'm not gonna use it. And it's, that was their attitude, like I won't be here to enjoy it, why should I get it for her? You know, and so it makes no sense, but that's how people think. You know? So a homemaker is a good thing, by the way, it's something that God wants young women to be. I get it. You might not want to stay home. Children might not be your thing. Hey, raising children is hard and difficult. And you need God's help and grace uh, to raise those children. But being a homemaker is not wrong at all. I think it, it's, it's something that should be lifted up and esteemed within the, the women community. So enough on that. So good, obedient to their own husbands. Oh, let me pass that one by. I don't even want to touch that. Obedient to their own husbands. <laughs> That's another cultural thing, right? The church has embraced it. You know, where women are no longer obedient to their husbands. They can make up their own minds, do their own things, go their own ways. You have women, you have marriages where a, a man and a wife now who are both working have their own banking accounts. And they do with their money as they seek pleased, you know, and so forth. That's not the case with Virginia and I. No, everything goes into one account and I use it all. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know, it, it's to be used for both of us, for our <coughs> livelihood, for the things that we need in this world today. And it's not her money. It's not my money. It's our money. You know, but we do that. We separate ourselves. And then when you separate yourselves, pretty much what you're saying is we're two entities now and we make our own decisions. So don't tell me what to do and you don't tell me what to do. When God tells us we're one, just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Father, God, represents the husband, by the way. The, the, Jesus represents the wife, okay, in that the, Jesus did everything that the Father had asked him to do. And the wife is to be obedient to the husband as he leads in the family. And guess who the Holy Spirit represents? The children, silent, and they just get the work done without saying anything. So that family unit is, is there within the scriptures and in the very nature of God himself. And we need to apply that. I think the church needs to get back to that uh, so desperately today because Amen. we're losing a lot of people. If you noticed, <clears throat> people aren't even getting married anymore. You have Christians living together now, just as the culture is uh, not get married anymore because we don't like relationships. We don't know how to have relationships. We have them on Facebook. You know, you can say whatever you want on Facebook, social media, and so forth. And if someone doesn't like you, unfriend, we're done. And you just move on. And you find the ones that are like-minded, and that's what you do. You have no relationship with someone one-on-one -on -one where you're talking to the person and you're mingling together. And by the way, that's why there's no growth within a lot of churches, because people don't want fellowship, which is so important to the church. Is that one-on-one -on -one fellowship or fellowship with human beings, not on Facebook. they rather have it on Facebook. they rather stay home where they can sit alone and not intermingle with people because people just are mean. And I don't like mean people and so <laughs> forth. You know, and, and, but that's what makes you grow. That, was, yeah. that is what helps your faith in Christ Jesus. That's what deepens your relationship. And that's what teaches you to forgive. That's what teaches you tolerance. That's what teaches you faith. That teaches you so many spiritual lessons that you're going to miss out if you just stay home and sit in a room with your pajamas on and say, oh, this is a wonderful message. You, you, you sound like the people of Ezekiel's days or Jeremiah's days. Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. You know, but then you walk away and do nothing with it. And that's the church today. So, um, they should be obedient to their husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemy. Wow, how important is that? Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Boy, that's what young men should be doing. Uh, I got the opportunity to watch a, a live stream yesterday of uh, a young, lady's, young lady and her son, and I was just blessed listening to to uh, what she has taught her son, because I've, I've known her for quite a while. Her name is Marlene, and, and she was um, 
uh, in a situation where she's a single mother raising this young man. And I, I remember when the boy was just a baby and now he's a young man. <clears throat> and just to hear him talking was just so encouraging. This is what young men should be doing. Talking about what he does at church and how he got plugged into this place and that place. And, and I was just like, wow, God has a call for this young man. Uh, his mama, just like uh, Lois and, and uh, Eunice, you know, um, did for Timothy. This is what this mama is doing for this young man. And he's going to go on to do do great, great works. This is what we should be doing with our young men is training them and teaching them. Uh, you know, to get into the ministry. Um, we had a, several people here that <clears throat> that I noticed had gifts, gifts that were, were um, charismatic, that were um, part of teaching. Uh, they were able to articulate themselves. They made sense. And I, I just like, Lord, these, these guys should be pastors. And I, off, I, I told them, I offered them, I said, hey, come alongside me and I'll train you up to start a church and send you out. Okay, oh yeah, 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 that sounds great. And I did that twice, and then they both left. They just both left. It's not what they wanted to do. Um, our young men should all be trained to be pastors. They should all be trained to be pastors. Does that mean they're going to be a pastor? Not necessarily. Well, that's all determined on God, but we should train them to be pastors, to be that good. They should be reading commentaries at a young age. They should be reading their Bibles. Uh, all my boys <clears throat> read their Bibles. They've gone through their whole Bible. And I'm talking about elementary and teenagers. You go read your Bible right now. You go take time. That I, I'd even, you know, some parents would probably disagree. Forget your schoolwork. Just go read your Bible right now. And you put God first and he'll take care of the rest. Now, I'm one that, that says, hey, there are people for, that are made for school and there are people that are not made for school. You know, and some of them were made for school and some of them were not made for school. But yet they're all successful and they're doing uh, the work of God in various churches and ministries. That's success, by the way. That is success. Um, not because they have a career and they're not plugged into church and they're not helping and not ministering. That's not success. You're living like the world. There's no difference from you. If I were to put you in a lineup there in the police station and, and there is a, um, the Apostle Paul and there's a lineup, could you tell me which ones are Christians? Wow. Well, that guy lives like that. He, he lives the same way. He lives the same. Uh, which would... That guy right there is always in church. That guy's always reading his Bible. He's always serving. He's, he's always tithing. He's always, you know, looking out for others. He's always kind. He's, you know, and you're like, he's got to be the Christian right there where everybody else looks the same. And unfortunately, it's hard to tell today. It's hard to tell. Christians can, Christians can tell who Christians are. Do you know that a football player can immediately tell you who a football player is? You know that? They just know He's a football player. I know that. Just by his talk, by his walk, by the things that he lives, he's a football player. Just like a tennis player or another athlete can tell another athlete. A boxer can tell who a boxer is, you know? A Christian can tell who a Christian is. You just can't because it's just so natural. And so we know. So this, is, this should be our young men. <clears throat> In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say to you. Can you imagine if you were just to look at this chapter here, guys, and start making a list of how you should be and then start applying it, how your life would change? It would change drastically. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, that is stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. He's talking about literally servants, slaves that were bought and purchased to be uh, slaves of a family household. Today, we would apply this to, to our work ethics that we are employees and we should be employees, uh, obedient, not insubordinate to employers, but being pleasing to them, working hard for them, making money for them, showing it all so that when they see us, they would not blasphemy God. That's how we should be in anything that we do. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So what should we deny? Ungodliness and worldliness. We need to deny that stuff. What should we embrace? Well, we should embrace 
the righteousness and godliness in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's our hope, isn't it? Amen. I was, I was talking to my mom the other day. Uh, I had to take her to the doctors. And she looked at me and she said, why do we have to suffer so much as we get older? You know, and I, I just kind of thought about that. And the Lord just kind of gave me some insight. And he said, because I'm preparing you for heaven. I don't want you to desire this world. Can you imagine if we all felt good all the time? Can you imagine if nothing ever hurt? Everything went well? No one ever got sick? Would we ever want to leave this place? No. No. <laughs> what for? What for? It gives us a yearning for heaven. You know, it gives us a yearning. Now, some of us might think, well, that's a suicide thought. No, not necessarily, because Paul also said, you know, that, that I desire heaven. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And he even said, Lord, uh, I'd love to stay here, but because of them, you know, I understand you need me, they need me there to share more about the, the truth. So I'm willing to be kind of spilled out as a sacrifice for their sake. Um, <clears throat> but yet, Paul hungered for heaven just like we all should be hungering for heaven. So I think that the pain and suffering that comes as it, it doesn't seem, it increases as you get older. It increases. You know, you, you lose your hearing. Huh? What? I, I, I love that. You just stop hearing people, which is good. Because you don't, you don't hear the complaints and the gripes anymore. You know, you don't have to hear that stuff. And you're just like, what? Okay, whatever. The bad thing about it is you start making up things that you didn't hear. You know, it's like, I think what they said was this, when you don't even have any idea what they said. And then your next thing is the, the eyesight, you know, you, you just lose your eyes. I remember when I was 44 and all of a sudden I'm like, what's going on? I can't read anymore. It's blurry. And I thought some tumor was in my head. So I went to the doctors and the guy says, you're getting old. I'm like, I'm 44. What do you mean I'm getting old? He goes, this happens to everybody. <coughs> that eyesight just grows dim. And I think it's a good thing too, because then you see how you can't see how old your wife is anymore, you know, and so it gets dimmer, you know, and so it's like, oh, you're beautiful, honey, you know, and because so, you can't see her, you know, and you still think she's 21 years old or 18 or in my case, 16, you know, and it's like, you're still beautiful, you know, and she's looking in the mirror like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, the, it goes the eyes, the ears, you know, and all of that and the memories, the next thing that you you, you start losing, you can't remember this, you can't remember that. And that's a good thing, too, because then you... You forget what people say about you. You forget the, the things that hurt and so forth. So it's good stuff, but it prepares you for heaven. And this is our hope, right? The hope and glory, glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purified uh, for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. Now that is to Titus as a pastor. Paul is saying, speak those things, Titus. Exhort those things to those people that aren't doing these things. Rebuke them with your authority that I have given to you, that God has given to you, and let no one despise you. Wow. That's not dictatorship, by the way. Will you have people that misunderstand you? Yes. Will you have people accuse you of being insensitive? Yes. But this is what Paul is telling him. You have to exhort him, rebuke him, authority. You see, when you're in a right standing with Christ, when you are born again, you embrace those things because you know they're truthful characteristics that you should have in your life. And someone comes up and says, Brother, you got to stop lying. You're like, oh, Father, forgive me. Instead of saying, oh, you're a liar too. You know, because that's what people would normally do. You're a liar too. So I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm trying to stop lying too. We need to stop lying. You, know, you need to, wh whatever it is, embrace and say, Lord, thank you that you care enough about my character that you're willing to change me because I must decrease and he must continually increase in my life. Amen? Amen. This is a, I love this chapter. I'd love to just cut and paste it and then just outline all the characteristics that we should have. I may do that one day and just pass it out. Uh, I just don't want it to be a religious thing, right? We want it to be from the heart. That yes. We want these things because our hearts desire to be more like Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And Lord, for your precious people, Lord, who are born again. 
who have a saving faith in Jesus Christ, who understand your scriptures, Lord, that are not offended by them, Lord, but embrace them and receive them openly, Lord, to say, Lord, would you help me? Father, be soberly minded, be reverent, Lord. Would you help me, Lord, uh, to leave the worldly lust and to embrace godly and righteousness, Lord? Would you help me, Lord, to look forward to the hope and glory of our great appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord? Help us, Lord God, to receive exhortation and correction, Lord, because we know it's for our benefit, because we're children of God, and, and there's no father that disciplines their children uh, because they're not his children, but it's because he loves them so dearly. And it's evidence of that love, Lord. May you pour your love upon your people, Lord. May they come back to the scriptures, Father, simply just your word, not man's interpretation or word, Lord, but your simple word, Lord. I pray, bring revival to the hearts of all people, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. God bless you. If you don't have a church, Love to see you here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley if you're in the neighborhood or in the nearest by cities and need a place that is actively involved in the community, uh, reaching out with the gospel message and fellowshipping and is full of love, this is the place you ought to be. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.